There is nothing yet on autism like what we had with schizophrenia in the 1970s, which had, in which there was a very large scale effort to look at schizophrenia across cultures. And what was found was that even though the prevalence of schizophrenia appeared to be fairly consistent across the globe, people in some countries did better. By better meaning um, fewer episodes of psychosis, less serious psychoses when they did occur, and then just better outcomes overall, including the ability to lead productive and meaningful lives, to have a work life, or marry. In India, individuals with schizophrenia have had surprising success finding spouses in Japan as well. And what we don't have yet is information on autism to figure out what it is that can really help outcomes of autism. And I'm not talking about medicines and I'm not talking about particular types of therapies. I'm talking about social and cultural conditions, which tend to be social supports. But you know, what, to what degree are these social supports helping children uh, to, to grow, adults to care for their children better, and to appreciate what strengths those children have, rather than assume from the outset that children are not capable and then not providing them with the services that can help them achieve. The outcome of the WHO studies was to show that people did best with schizophrenia in non-industrialized societies. They did the worst in Washington, D.C., and London, and the best in Agra, India, and Ibadan, Nigeria. We know that culture has an important impact on how diseases are classified and identified. And there's a famous case from the 1970s in which a group of psychiatrists did a cross-national study, and in one particularly notable case, they gave a video of a young bachelor uh, with schizophrenia, at least he'd been diagnosed with schizophrenia in the United States, to psychiatrists, and found that 69% of the American psychiatrists diagnosed the person with schizophrenia, but only 2% of the British psychiatrists, the British psychiatrists tending to diagnose a manic depressive illness at the time. Well, imagine if there are such pronounced cultural differences in the diagnosis of a mental illness between two countries that have the same language that have shared a tremendous amount of research infrastructure, how different must the psychiatric establishment be in India, or in Ghana, or in Niger, or in Kenya, or New Guinea. Question is, to what degree is there a growth in standardization of diagnostic terms and classification? Uh, I would suggest that there is increasing standardization as evidenced by anecdotes like the one I mentioned from South Africa. One of the things that an anthropologist can do in talking about autism is to, to make the argument that sometimes when we think about an illness in a different way, it's not because the illness changed or because there's a new disease, but rather because we now think about the illness in a different way. This is all basically the, 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 the job of the medical anthropologist, which is to say uh, lots of things that we think of as grounded in biology are in fact constructed by culture. And some of the most amazing things seem to have been created out of cultural processes. Take the division of human beings into male and female. I mean, prior to the late 1700s, it was thought there was just one sex, male. The notion that there are two distinct, fixed sexes is only a couple of hundred years old. The word homosexuality, which came to define an illness in the DSM-1 and the DSM-2, uh, did not come about as a category, as a concept, as a thing, an entity, a phenomenon, until the late 1800s. First usage of the word homosexuality in the Oxford English Dictionary is 1892. Before that, I mean, you can't have homosexuality without a concept of sexuality and the notion that there was some sort of sexuality, some inner disposition, something that was a part of us, is very, very new. Now, this change in seeing the human race, the human pe people, as divided into male and female, uh, that didn't come about because of new anatomical discoveries. None at all. It had to do with cultural shifts in the Industrial Revolution. 
when we now start to think that there's such a thing as homosexuality, that didn't come about because all of a sudden people started having sex with people who were the same sex as them, because it happened long before, all the way back to ancient Greece. But in ancient Greece, there was no concept of homosexuality at all. So what this tells us is that biology is not defining the way in which we understand our bodies, our behavior, our minds, and our capabilities. And we only have to go back a few decades, and we can just be so surprised at how we used to think about autism. In the DSM-1, the very first Bible of psychiatry, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, the only mention of the word autism was in the criteria for schizophrenia. In the DSM-2, the only mention of autism was in the criteria for childhood schizophrenia, a disorder that may not even exist. Judy Rappaport at the NIMH has been looking for childhood schizophrenia for two decades and has found only a few dozen cases. Whether a new diagnostic term comes into play or a new framework for understanding differences neurologically and behaviorally depends on whether that diagnosis is meaningful. It is not meaningful to the Navajo Indians to see autism as something bad. They do not see autism as something that should be negatively valued. Rather, it is a condition of perpetual childhood. And because mothers take great care of their autistic children, and it's a matrilineal society. There's a lot of uh, ability for a child to remain and live with her mother for the rest of its life. And the, there, is, there isn't this sense among the Navajo that the goal of any development is independent living. I mean, that's just not something that comes into play for them. So they hear American parents, other American parents saying, will my child be able to live independently? Will my child be able to live by himself? They look at that and they say, well, why would you want that anyway? I mean, just this, I don't even understand why that would be the, you know, the sort of thing that you would want to do. You know, and this is something anthropologists, we confront this, you know, day in, day out, you know, whether it's somebody saying, I heard that, you know, I go to Africa and people say, I hear you circumcise babies. Is that true? How could you do such a horrible thing? Anyway, because you should wait till they're 14 <laughs> or 15, you know, not, you shouldn't hurt a little baby. Um, in India, the diagnosis of autism, very, very rare, because the, even the doctor that is aware of autism will say, well, I can't do anything with this diagnosis of autism because we don't have autism services and nobody knows what this term means, so I'm not going to diagnose the term autism. I'm going to give your child a term of mental retardation. And the parent says, mm, but my child's not mentally retarded. Um, he's got average or above average intelligence. And the physician says, it doesn't matter because we need to get services for your child. And the diagnosis drives the service. So we give the diagnosis. And this is true in the United States. Uh, Judy Rappaport, again, I'll quote her again, the head of child psychiatry at the National Institute of Mental Health, said, I will diagnose a kid as a zebra if it gets him the educational services that he needs and deserves. I don't think she really meant it as a joke. Um, the, the really, you know, the child... The good child psychiatrist, in my opinion, is not the child psychiatrist who's just looking at the condition of the disease, but is thinking about education, because education is such a crucial intervention. And so I think some of the best clinicians are saying to themselves, look, I could be a slave to the DSM, or I could ask myself, what educational environment is going to help this child the most? And if the educational environment is in this school or this classroom that requires a diagnosis of X or Y, sure, why not? Because it's all about helping the child and not being a slave to some pre-existing set of classifications. One of the things that happened in the United States that had a very positive effect on the growth of services in autism was during the 1970s, in particular, when doctors started to appreciate 
that autism didn't just happen in the children of educated white college professors. That autism did not respect ethnic or racial or socioeconomic status boundaries. And uh, it might surprise you if you look at the literature just to see how much ink was spilled on this question of whether autism occurs more in people of higher socioeconomic status. Now we know that people get diagnosed more among in families of kids with higher uh, in families of higher socioeconomic status, but who knows whether that is because they are more likely to seek help and seek care. If you look at the patients of many of the people who began doing work on autism, you find that they did come from the children of psychiatrists and the children of professors. But that's because the people who were taking their kid to specialists were people who had insurance, who had means, who had the ability, the motivation, and the inclination to do that. And I, I want to show you a, uh, a little clip here uh, from a film called Refrigerator Mothers. And in this film, a woman from Chicago, Dorothy Groomer, talks about uh, the difficulty of getting her son a diagnosis uh, back when uh, he was very young. And again, this is all geared toward my central argument, that when we see the rise in awareness and reported prevalence of autism, let's stop a minute and think about whether or not increased prevalence is a positive thing. When Stephen was not even two years old, I was at the library, and the librarian said something about, uh, 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 we have some books here, you, uh, would you like to read something on autism? You know? And I said, autism? The little things according to this book seem to identify with Stephen. The rigidity, the repetitiveness. The next time I was at the doctor's office, I asked if he thought Stephen had autism. And it was more than one doctor at that time, it was a team of them, over at the University of Illinois. And they said no. Said, uh, it may be an emotion disturbance, but it's not autism. We did not fit the mold. We did not fit the classic mold for autism. Which is? Which is white, upper middle class, and very, very bright. Jimmy is an autistic child, 11 years old. His father is a specialist in nuclear power plants. Joseph is seven years old. Both of his parents are college graduates. His father is a college professor. It was really not a negotiable issue. According to my doctors, my son could not be autistic. Uh, I was not white, and it was assumed that I was not educated. And therefore, he was labeled emotionally disturbed. Well, 